Yeah. Okay. Uh, today we have uh, Professor Alice Bean. She is a full professor uh, uh, here at KU. She joined the faculty in 1993, uh, and before that, she did. Uh, uh, she got a PhD uh, in uh, Carly, uh, uh, Carnegie Mellon. Carnegie Mellon. Uh, uh, university and, and then she did uh, 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 several years of uh, postdoctoral research associateship at Santa Barbara. Uh, and Professor Bean uh, has been working in the, in the field of high energy physics uh, in different experiments like uh, uh, D zero and CMS. And in the last last year, she was uh, away uh, from Lawrence. She spent some time in Washington D.C. as part of the. Jefferson Fellowship uh, is, a, is a special program that is run by the department, uh, the State Department, and during her stay, uh, she contributed uh, with different uh, people there and scientists as well and engineers uh, in topics related to to science, religion, and developing countries uh, programs, which sounds uh, very interesting. And today. She's going to tell us about what what she was doing there and and all the interesting things. So, okay, yeah. thanks. So it's uh, really great to be back. I'm happy to be back in Kansas. Um, so for those of you who don't know, I normally do experimental particle physics at the CMS uh, collaboration with the CMS collaboration where we uh, help to discover the Higgs boson and with the and you guys could all buy your own Higgs boson. This is the advertisement. You can buy it at the uh, Natural History Museum gift shop. But uh, when um, we're really excited because the LHC is back on now. And so part of what I did while I was away was help uh, to continue my research in experimental particle physics, which is part of what we're doing. But I want to thank my research group for actually um, uh, standing by me while I was away in Washington DC and as you're going to see I'm going to talk about uh, a different cultural experience that I had for the entire year and it was a fantastic experience but it was different than being a professor and it was different than being a scientist and so part of what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and carry you along by um, showing you all the stuff I had to learn. So I'm not a climate change scientist. I didn't really know anything about religion and I really didn't know anything about the State Department. So it's great, this is what I did last year. So I'll, I'll talk to you about it as this Jefferson Science Fellowship. So um, one of the things that I have to do, which everyone laughs at because we find it amusing, <coughs> is I was actually representing the State Department from August of 2014 to August 10th of this year. I could not give this talk before August 10th. Why? Because I would have to clear it with the State Department and then I would be speaking on behalf of the State Department. I am not speaking on behalf of the State Department today. I am speaking to you as Alice Bean KU faculty member, which is a different thing. It allows me to say different things as well, which is uh, pretty fun, okay? <laughs> it's actually hard to speak as a representative from the State Department. So um, I will tell you this, I am still a consultant with the State Department and my office has heard what I'm gonna say and they are happy with me saying it, so it's not like I'm saying stuff that they would dis... Did you have your own server and wipe it? Yeah, but we won't talk about that kind of stuff. <laughs> but what we will talk about is, uh, so I'll tell you about what a Jefferson Science Fellowship is, and then I'll tell you what I learned about climate change, uh, and then we'll talk about a lot of what I did had to do with the U United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And the most interesting stuff is on science and communication. Then I'll get to what we do at the State Department or what people do at the State Department and in particular the office that I chose. Okay, I chose to be in this office. I had lots of choices and I chose really incredibly well. I loved my office, they loved me, and I think I did some good work. And then I'll discuss faith groups and the environment after that. So, 
you guys get to have quizzes. So here's the first quiz. Which one of the following did Thomas Jefferson not do? First Secretary of State, re-engineered the plow, invented a urinary catheter, published scientific papers on paleontology, invented methods for excavating archaeological sites. How many people think A? B. C. D. <laughs> e. Okay, now, we do live in the United States where people are supposed to vote, okay? So that means you can guess, you're not penalized for guessing here or voting, okay? So we want 100% vote rate on the next one. So the answer is, what did Jefferson not do? He did not invent a urinary catheter. That was Benjamin Franklin. Okay, so uh, all of these quote fan founding fathers are actually really quite amazing guys and did a lot of science. And um, so part of the reason the Jefferson Science Fellowship is named after Jefferson was because he was, he was both the first US Secretary of State and he was a science statesman. Well, um, most of us know that he oversaw the Louisiana Purchase and he did help invent modern agricultural science. So because he was a statesman for science, that's why the Jefferson Science Fellowship is named for that. This is Monticello, which is the house he designed. I don't think I'd like to be his son-in-law. You know, we can all discuss how he actually ran his life and whether you want to live with him, but he was an amazing guy nevertheless. So what is the Jefferson Science Fellowship? It started in 2003 and it brings tenured uh, faculty to the State Department and the U.S. Agency for International Development. And on the website you see accurate science for statecraft and I'll just use whatever that means. Uh, so it's been running 10 years and each year there's approximately 10 scientists who are chosen. Uh, University of Kansas supported me while I was there with my salary and I want to thank University of Kansas and this department for doing so. This was an amazing opportunity. The uh, government supported me so I could actually live in Washington DC, <laughs> um, which I couldn't have done on my KU salary. And uh, the National Academy of Sciences actually administer the program and, and choose who, who makes it. So if you are interested in this, you can read more about it at the site. And of course, you can come talk to me. So here I am at the Jefferson Memorial. That's outside of it in Washington. And uh, Jefferson, when he was the first uh, Secretary of State, actually was very bright and would sign all the books there so that they stayed in the, in the State Department. Otherwise, they would have gone to various places. And so this is one of the books that he signed is in the State Department uh, Rare Books Collection in the library, which is the history of treaties of peace. And it was fun to actually see some of this stuff like that. So, I was blessed to have an incredible group of people that were there with me and we all had to learn about the big culture shock. So one of the big culture shocks is you have to wear suits, okay? Now do you have to wear the suit? No, but part of the culture is you don't want to stick out. So you have to wear the uniform. So I wore my one of these suits that I had to go buy. I, I wore one of my State Department suits today. Uh, and part of the issue is that sticking out, not doing bright colors, okay? And it's also for a culture in the department that you're supporting people and you're trying to speak as one voice and you don't want to stand out by saying something that's wrong or actually drawing attention to yourself. So as a faculty member, you're used to being the big ego and so this is actually part of what you have to figure out is how you are just part of this big team where you're all trying to support the big team. So uh, I got help 
by all of these people who were all in the same boat as me. So there were 13 Jefferson Science Fellows, like Anil here is from K-State, uh, a double E professor. Then we had two physicists, Martin and Steve. There I am in my nice suit. And all these guys, if we didn't have each other, we wouldn't have figured out things. So it was really great. But it was this culture that we all had to figure out. Part of that culture also had to be that there's no cell phones, they had a security clearance, uh, no cell phone re uh, reception. I couldn't get on my laptop, there's no internet in the building. Can't take your internet to the building, can't plug in any of your devices in the building. And so I would come home, I would go to work at 8, come home at 4, and then start doing my university work because it didn't really work at the State Department. So um, this was great. So I learned about Jefferson Science Fellows. Then the next thing I figured I had to do is learn about climate change. Okay. So here's our next quiz. All of the following are fully supported by the science, except our planet continues to build up heat with warming indicators being seen all over our climate. B, many lines of evidence and human fingerprints indicate that humans are currently driving climate change. C, 40% of all species could be at risk of extinction by the end of the century if we continue on without change. D, the record snowfall in 2015 in Boston was affected by climate change, or E, the California drought is caused by climate change. Okay, how many people say A, B, C, D, E. Okay kind of a, a mishmash there. The answer is E. What is the key point in there? The key point is the word is. Okay. The science uh, is, is clear on all the other one. Notice the word here is affected by and it was not is. Climate change, uh, the science of climate change actually predicts many things, including that there's going to be uh, more frequent droughts and stuff like that, but we can't tell if any one incident is caused by climate change itself. Now, in the record snowfall in Boston was affected by it because there's a huge amount of energy being stored in the ocean, and that actually is affecting how much energy was, uh, was uh, available to get the snowfall that Boston received. So it definitely was affecting it. So all this climate scientists, I, you know, all the climate science, I, you know, I knew some about it. And one of the nice things about this thing was that I got to go and I got to study about this because I thought I should know more about this because I'm supposedly working on climate change. And so I actually studied a, a, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is considered the international consensus. And I, I studied a lot of other things. So I'm just going to give you two slides on what I found out because I didn't actually have to explain climate change to anybody I worked with. It, nobody. <laughs> nothing. Nobody needed to know the science, okay? Everyone I worked with, the public, the government, they all knew it, okay? So this is an important point. So what, it, what do we know? There are, um, here, what I'm doing is quoting from the 2014 National Climate Assessment, which is actually a very nice scientific document. And in it, it, it points to there's many others, but here's 10 indicators of a warming world. So there's the air temperature, there's the sea ice going down, there's the snow cover going down, glaciers going down, sea level going up. And most of us know that the CO2 concentration is going up and that and the global temperature has been going up. One of the things that I really didn't know much about, which is actually more scary to me and more interesting to me, is the fact that the oceans are becoming more acidic. And this is a major problem. 
So here actually we have the CO2 concentration from Mauna Loa as well as the uh, CO2 or those going up and then on this scale you're seeing the pH concentrations of the ocean going down. Uh, this acidity is actually causing a bunch of uh, issues with shellfish and other marine life. Now the other thing that I learned a lot about and I had many chances to actually go learn about this science there, okay? Some by scientists who were presenting it and some by other people who actually helped me understand a lot more issues. But then I also uh, took part in a couple of massively online open courses that I was invited to by both faith groups and the World Bank. And they actually have these incredible open sources on climate change science where I actually learned the most. As uh, one of the, uh, I was going to a, a presentation for the Navy and it was a non-scientist talking about it and he, he asked, well, how many people have actually read the IPCC report? And people actually, it's hard to read the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report, because it is really dense. It is written for scientists. The international government, the IPCC, is also a consensus document. So there are some things in there that he pointed out, and many others have, that are actually very conservative on the science. For instance, the glacial melt in, the, um, in Antarctica, because they don't, there's not 100% agreement or whatever agreement, was left out of the fourth assessment report. So the uh, sea level rise actually could be much worse than the IPCC report says. And so the Navy and everyone who is planning are actually more worried about that and are actually that is actually more important to them than just following what the scientific consensus is. So the other thing is, okay, how do we really know that the humans are causing it? Well, this is just one plot which shows that if you look at the natural uh, factors only, that you wouldn't be seeing this rise. So one of the main ones that I found interesting is that actually in the troposphere, uh, it was predicted back in the 50s with global warming that it would actually be cooler uh, with human intervention and that's what everything sees. So for, you know, for those of us who think, yeah, who knows about those climate scientists, are they really doing it? There's a lot of them out there and there's a lot of stuff out there, okay? And, and most of the time you're, we're not paying attention to this stuff so we really don't realize how much is out there. Now, Part of the reason that we're not paying attention to it is that we're wondering how it's affecting us. So if we look in Kansas, this is from the National Climate Assessment, you can see the temperature in Kansas has gone up a little if we look at from 1991 to 2012. You can see much more that Southern California and the East Coast are noticing these effects. But the climate science also predicts that it doesn't go up everywhere. So this is a very regionally interesting thing. It depends on where you are. And so now we, you know that this climate science is out there. It's, it's pretty <laughs> overwhelming. And, but people aren't paying attention, okay? So let's look at the procedure that has actually been in place. It's called the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. So which statement is not true? UNFCCC is an international environmental treaty negotiated in Rio de Janeiro in 1992 and the now 196 parties meet annually at the conferences of the parties. B, the 1997 Kyoto Protocol established legally binding obligations for developed countries to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions up to 2020. C, the U.S. ratified the Kyoto Protocol. D, the U.S. emissions by 2012 were on track to satisfy the Kyoto Protocol. And E, uh, President Obama made a pledge to reduce U.S. emissions 17% below 2005 levels by 2020. How many people say A? B. C, D, okay, E. Okay, the correct answer is C. 
there was only one correct answer. And what the surprising thing to me was is that the U.S. is actually on track to satisfy the emission goals. But we never ratified the Kyoto Protocol. A treaty takes 67 senators to vote to ratify it in the United States. So this has actually caused the U.S. to have all kinds of problems in international negotiations. So we should remember that internationally, people understand what is happening in the U.S. They understand what it takes to ratify a treaty. And if you think that people who go to these negotiations don't understand what people are seeing on Fox News or anywhere else, then you are mistaken. These people know all about what is happening in the U.S. So part of what we have to do is figure out if we're going to one of these conferences, and this is our past history, how can we talk to people so that they believe that we will do anything different in the future? Okay? This is what our negotiation position is, is at this point because this is our history. So, how is the U.S. Um, trying to reduce our CO2 emissions. So a lot of this is coming out more now. You can see the whole plan, the President's Climate Action Plan. You can find the whole Climate Action Plan on what the whole U.S. plan is for reducing CO2 emissions. And it involves deploying clean energy. Uh, one of the things that I, I was surprised to find out is the actual amount of renewable energy that has increased dramatically and there's still plans to re, uh, increase it more. Uh, and what's been in the news a lot lately from the EPA, the Carbon Pollution Standard for Power Plants. So these are all administrative options. They're not supposedly subject to Congress. Of course, we can always get lawsuits that, that delay these, but all of these things are stuff that we believe <laughs> The, the administration believes can happen without a vote. So there's increasing fuel economy standards, advanced transportation technologies. This is actually responsible for most of our carbon uh, decrease since 2005. Energy efficiency standards have been continually being put in place, uh, curbing HFCs methane and preserving forests. And one of the amazing things is the government is actually doing this in buildings. So there's the Treasury, the old Treasury building, which is right next to the White House, which was made in the 1800s. This is a LEED certified building. If you look at embassies all over the world, they're actually doing incredible things to reduce their carbon footprint. So at the federal level, all, there's all sorts of, of, of initiatives that actually reduce our carbon footprint. So what is this all leading to? It's called the Paris COP, Paris Conference of the Parties, which is the 21st meeting here. So these are annual meetings. So this meeting in December 2015 is actually important because, well, they're all important, but this meeting is the one where the idea is to sign the new agreement or to figure out what the new agreement is past 2020. And this was a targeted year for doing that. So, in the past, there's many negotiators, and this is a legal process where all these 196 p groups come to the table, and it's agreed that there's two parts of this. One is mitigation, which is trying to reduce our carbon footprint, and the other one is adaptation for the amount of um, climate change that is already happening. So there's uh, what is sometimes called the global south or the poor countries, and um, in, in the past, part of the reason the Kyoto Protocol wasn't accepted is that there was these Annex I countries, which like the U.S. are the historical carbon polluters, and the, the poor countries. And so the question is, is how much do, do the historical emitters and the rich countries have to support the poor countries towards adapting to this climate change that's already happening? For instance, in Tuvalu or the Marshall Islands where the sea is already uh, overwhelming people, 
how much is it the fault, quote, the fault of, of rich countries, and so how much do, does the U.S. have to bail out the rest of the world, uh, along with the other uh, uh, Annex I countries? So this mitigation, they've decided, includes what we call the intended nationally determined contributions. So we're trying to go away from this, annex, the U.S. is trying to go away from this Annex 1 and Annex 2 by having everyone contribute to some intended uh, nationally determined contribution. In the U.S., Obama announced the, that we're going to reduce 26 to 28 percent compared to 2005. So. Um, also, China an announced uh, back in November, Obama and, and China announced various things that helped to start spurring on these uh, declarations of these. Then the other part of it is this adaptation. So there's this fund that's supposed to be a public and, pub and private partnership to help the, the poor countries. And um, the version of this now is called the Green Climate Fund. It's just coming online. And uh, currently, there's over 10 billion in pledges. The US has pledged over 3 billion. For, and this is the largest contribution. So this is to assist in both mitigation and adaptation. So, U.S. Department of State, the boss asks Secretary Kerry, who we all work for when we're at the Department of State. Department of State is responsible for international relations and all of these green places are where in the world where we have embassies, consulate, diplomatic missions. Uh, so just recently, Cuba is now, has now turned green. We got Iran, Syria, North Korea, and part of a disputed place near uh, Myanmar, as well as there's some weirdness around the Western Sahara, where we don't have official ties. So the U.S. State Department is responsible for this. So when I went, I didn't know much more than you go for a visa, you go to a consulate, your passport, okay? So we, that's what we sort of know about the U.S. Department of State, or I knew about it. I really didn't understand what else it does. I'm not sure I understand all of what it does, but here is a list of things just maybe relevant to what I was working on. So what does, I put more here because it was an amazing amount of things and there's more I can't tell you about that I'm really amazed at. Uh, the State Department does all but A, determine the USINDC, the in, uh, Intended Nationally Determined Contribution, and the Green Climate Fund amounts towards the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. B, is responsible for the Fulbright Scholars Program. C, encourages acceptance of the U.S. Global Positioning Satellite System. D, negotiates the ITER, that's this fusion, nuclear fusion program impl implementation. E, train young men and women to become technology entrepreneurs. F, protect the marine environment from pollution. G, takes the leading role in developing strategies to defeat terrorists abroad. Okay, A. B. C, D, E, F, G. Okay, none of you got the right answer. <laughs> so the State Department has nothing to do with determining this, but the State Department does do all of the rest. Okay, and in fact, they are the boss of the military in terms of this. Uh, so the State Department people, when I was giving this talk, they, they also were saying, gee, and I said, I took this directly from the State Department website. <laughs> uh, they actually have a, a place that, uh, that they actually lead on, on, on what the plan is going to be. Okay, uh, and they do all of this other stuff that we might consider science. So some of this stuff is actually supported by law through the government. For instance, the Fulbright Scholars Program is funded in a special program. Uh, 
these negotiations and stuff um, are part of what has to do the marine environment is worldwide, so that's an international plan. So you have to work on that. So anything that has to do with the U.S. working internationally goes through the State Department. And some of it is funded uh, specifically through programs, but most of it is just part of what is happening there. So one of the main things I want to leave you with is you are the government. Okay, now what do I mean? This is one of the two things that I found out there. So the State Department actually doesn't have huge amounts of money to do a bunch of this stuff. So we count on you actually doing most of the work, okay? So a lot of times people would say, well, you guys are the State Department, why don't you pay to do this? And I'd say, we don't have the money to do that. Um, don't you understand? Congress hasn't uh, told us that we can do that. So, uh, hasn't supported us for that. So, a lot of what we did in the State Department was actually enable you, because you live in a democracy and you care about what is happening, to actually do things, okay? So a lot of times people are like, well, you guys have to negotiate this intended nationally determined contribution, or you have to make it so that global temperature rise will be less than two degrees centigrade. Well, State Department can do nothing about that. <laughs> The you as the public has to allow and has to care enough to worry about this negotiation. Okay? So what does that mean? Obama has only pledged what he thinks you will support. Okay? If you don't support doing more, he can't <coughs> force you to do more, so he has done what he thinks he can do. Okay, unless Congress does stuff, unless you do stuff, our negotiating position is we're doing all that you want us to do. Okay, so it is not the State Department who is going to negotiate what intended nationally determined contribution or how much money we're pledging to the Green Climate Fund. It is you and your voice that is determining this. And this is to empower you because actually most of the time people would say, you guys do this, and I'd say, no, I'm going to help you do it, okay? And so that's one of the main questions I, uh, one of the main things I learned is that you do actually have the power to do all sorts of things. So that is mostly what I did was help empower people. So. Uh, you know, scientists know there's a consensus on climate change, and I'm worried about climate change. But, you know, most people don't give a crap, okay? It is not affecting a lot of people, they think, in the U.S., although it is actually affecting them more than they think. So, if you aren't caring about this, it's not going to happen. However, it is an uh, administration priority to get a strong agreement at the Paris COP. So, how do we start communicating this? Well, one of the things that people keep finding is the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change kept saying, look, people are just not understanding what the problem is. If we give them more facts, everyone will start working on this, okay? And so one of the great things that I got to do is meet this lady here. Her name is Catherine Hayhoe. She's a climate scientist. She's on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, whatever that means, but she also helped write the National Assessment, uh, Climate Assessment. She's a, a political science professor, even though she uh, was an astrophysicist uh, originally, before she became a climate scientist at Texas Tech. And she has this wonderful video that people should see. Uh, and at the at UCAR, the, um, out of Colorado. And she and other people are saying, look, scientists have been telling the facts, but the, you know, we can yell all we want, but nobody cares, okay? Some people care, but not a lot. So why 
is all this just bouncing off? And now we have to understand a little bit about the social science and how this communication is happening and why people don't care. So one of the problems is that we're not the best communicators. But even if we are the best communicators, we keep throwing these facts at people, but we're not actually sh uh, helping things. There's been studies that show that the more facts we provide people, the worse they become entrenched in the opposite way. <clears throat> okay? So understanding how people's brains work with their worldviews we it was actually a real, uh, it, it was really interesting to me, and this was uh, one of the things that I found the most uh, stimulating is just telling them, it all makes sense to us, why don't people listen? Well, the more we tell them, if we're not actually explaining how it fits in and understanding that they have a different worldview, then it actually is backfiring on us, okay? It's actually making them more entrenched. The more facts they are getting, the worse they are becoming in believing about climate change. So, what is going on here? Okay, so let me explain this question a little. So, a lot of this has to do with whether your political views. Okay, so we have Republicans and Democrats. So, if you ask Republicans, uh, how do you, uh, do you approve of President Obama? Okay, and you ask Democrats the same thing. Then obviously we're expecting that Democrats will have a higher approval rating of President Obama than Republicans. So when you ask Democrats something and Republicans something, the biggest difference between Republicans and Democrats is in their approval of President Obama. Okay, now let's look at one of the highest of these things, which one has the largest difference between Republicans and Democrats? The death penalty, Arctic weather, evolution, making abortion legal, and trust of scientists. How many people think A? B? C? D? E? Okay. The correct answer is the most difference between Republicans and Democrats is in trust of scientists. <coughs> okay, so here's the top, which is uh, approval of Obama. Now the next thing here is on climate change. Okay, I didn't give you that. But there's a big difference between uh, Republicans and Democrats on climate change. And then gun control is actually above trust of scientists. Okay, but Trusting scientists has a bigger difference than death penalty and abortion legal. So we have to understand that there is this disconnect according to your public, uh, according to your political views. Yeah. So what do you mean by trust the scientist here? Uh, so if you're a scientist and you go tell somebody something, and I'm a Republican, I'm more likely to say, yeah, well, he's just making money off of his government grants and not trust what you say. But I don't trust scientists. <laughs> <laughs> but the difference between the Republicans <laughs> and the Democrats is big here, okay? More, more Democrats trust scientists than Republicans do. <laughs> the per percentage difference between Republicans and Democrats, not the percentage that trust scientists. Okay, now if you actually look at this report and find out what percentage trust scientists, there is a large fraction of Republicans that trust scientists, okay, but the percentage difference between the uh, uh, Republicans and Democrats. Okay, so that's one thing you have to deal with. Now here's another. Among people who reject climate change in the U.S., that's less than 13 percent of the U.S., by the way, it's, it is a small number, what is the most common response when asked for the first words that come to mind when thinking about climate change? A, it's natural. B, it's hyped. C, it's a conspiracy theory. D, doubt the science. E, flat denial. How many people think A? B. C. D. E. 
Okay, so um, most of you don't realize that the answer is it's a conspiracy theory. Okay, so understand this is where scientists are in our society, okay? So given that, having a scientist speak may not be your best option, okay? <laughs> but that said, I'm a scientist working at the State Department. How, how can I help things along, okay? So let's, um, and by the way, one of the best MOOCs I took was actually um, recommended to me by faith groups and it's called Denial 101X. It's a free thing. And I learned more about everything on climate science and how the social science works on this. You guys, you can take it now. Uh, it's a wonderful course. So, what is diplomacy? Diplomacy is communicating, okay? Now, um, that communication may be with groups that you don't necessarily always communicate with. So if everything is hunky-dory, we're all happy with each other, we don't have to talk to people who we don't agree with. But if we want to do something, we have to talk to people who we don't agree with, okay? Or who might not have our whole world view. So we have to figure out how to do that. So I worked on climate change at the State Department and I worked in two areas. I worked in the policy helping to promote the U.S. interest towards COP21 and that's um, mostly what I did. And I worked a little bit in international development. Um, this is the, um, Albert Einstein. He is actually right outside the National Academy of Sciences and the State Department's right back there and the National Academy is right there. You can go sit on his lap and you can read uh, Hume actually got to read, uh, you know, it has uh, physics equations on here. And this is actually, a lot of people visit this and, and they want to take their picture. His nose is all rubbed off because everyone goes and rubs his nose. So if you're visiting Washington, you should think about going to see Albert. So on the development work, most of the development in, uh, is done with a sister agency, the U.S. Agency for International Development. I did not work with them, but these are some of the things that they're doing. Um, the U.S. Uh, the State Department, this is a sister agency, and so um, we actually do collaborate on a bunch of stuff. So there's a whole suite of things that our foreign aid is um, going to, and the USAID actually has the money for the foreign aid. Um, Power Africa, low emission development strategy, uh, Secretary Clinton uh, put in a whole thing on clean cook stoves to try and remove uh, short-lived climate pollutants that kill four million people each year. Renewable energy projects, water conservation, desalinization, sustainable ag, wildlife protection, combating deforestation. There's a, a lot of foreign aid and stuff working on this. What I mostly worked with was the policy. So, according to a 2010 demographic study by the Pew Research Center, how many people worldwide identify with a religious group? A, 16%, B, 52%, C, 68%, D, 75%, E, 84%. How many say A? B, C, D, E. Well, the answer is E. 84% of people in the world identify with some religious group. So you can see here the, um, the, uh, the unaffiliated is this other 16%. So of the people in the world, 31.5% of them are Christians, but there's a huge amount of Muslims and Hindus. Where's China in this? China, um, China actually has folk uh, religions and they actually have a lot of Buddhists. And they're in this 16% unaffiliated, but if you actually lift Taoism, all of that, huge numbers. So. Uh, a lot of Chinese actually identify with the religion. Uh, folk religions are uh, huge in China. Uh, Jewish is only 0.2%. So, given this, 
the Secretary Kerry started the office in the Bureau of the, of the Secretary of Office of, that I was in. It's called now Religion and Global Affairs. And because they're kind of futzy about wording, and I learned how to write, maybe, but everyone had to keep rewriting what I said. I'm going to use the exact words, but uh, what Secretary Kerry says is we ignore the global impact of religion, in my judgment, at our apparel. So why was our office created? Religion has a significant impact on a range of U.S. foreign policy priorities, making it critical that we continue and strengthen our efforts to assess religious dynamics and engage religious actors while pursuing our diplomacy and development objectives. With 84% of people around the world identifying with a religious group, religion is a powerful force in global politics and civil society, one that must be taken seriously. But our office also has to understand that just because you claim you're a Muslim, uh, it doesn't mean that, uh, that we understand exactly where you're coming from. So we have to look at lived religion, which is not the theoretical religion, and it differs all over the place. So what do faith groups care? Well, I didn't know before I came into this that they actually did care about the environment, okay? And it was my job, and I got the inaugural position to actually map how faith groups around the world and in the U.S. are working on environmentalism and, and climate change. Um, so when I got in, right, uh, right soon after, I got to go to New York City. I wasn't there for the march, but the march in September 21st, 2014, had, uh, that had 400,000 people in New York City, uh, had a huge contingent, and it was one of the major organizers of uh, faith groups who were worshiping for climate justice. So why do they care? Environmental protection is really part of the core teaching beliefs and practices. They believe that it's their moral responsibility. Now, of interest also is faith groups actually own 7% of the habitable land on the, in the world, on the planet. And one of the important things is that faiths reach out to every village in town and garner public trust most of the time. So um, they care. And um, then the question is now, well, what about the U.S.? So in the U.S., the nuns are 22%, uh, uh, not 16%. So in the U.S., 78% affiliate with some religion. So I'm putting this on here because as scientists, we tend to have this gut reaction of what we believe about face. And um, so let's look at it. The lived religion is different everywhere you go. So what is this a plot of? This is a, sp a plot of support for environmental regulations versus support for evolution. So if you really want to support environmental regulations and evolution, you're up here. And notice it tends to follow this line. Um, but there's tons and tons of different religions. The size of the circles have to do with how many people there are in that basic group in the U.S. I've, I've, I've expanded some of these, like the Jewish is up here, and the Catholics are here, and then there's white Baptists or more evangelicals that we like to think of. But the Catholics are the blue guys, the mainline Protestant are these purple guys, then we have evangelical Protestant, which are the more pink guys, historically black Protestant. So you can see that a lot of the U.S. is, is Christian. That's the major religion in the U.S. But there are these others. There's Muslims, there's Hindus, and then there's these others. And then there's the ones that have no religion. And you notice they're here uh, in here. So we have the whole scale of things based on our gut reaction of where we thought, yeah, we thought the evangelicals would be a little worse here. And yeah, we, the, the Jews might be way up there. Uh, notice the Catholics are sort of in the middle. So how does that have to do with anything? So all of these religions have many people in it. It's not a one uh, coat fits all. So, true or false? Let's look at the evangelicals. 
Over 63,000 pro-life Christians in Florida sent petitions to the governor calling on him to address impacts of climate change and support the EPA Clean Power Plan. They're probably all over 50 though. <laughs> okay, how many people think true? How many people think false? Okay, the answer is true. The Evangelical Environmental Network is actually a huge uh, group. Uh, also, there's Young Evangelicals for Climate Action. Uh, these people engage thousands of people all over the U.S., all over, uh, hundreds of thousands of people all over the U.S. And they also have um, evangelicals also are, are supporting uh, groups in Malawi to build solar panels on houses. There's groups in the Congo who the Young Evangelicals for Climate Action are working with the Baptist College in, in the Congo for renewable energy. There's huge amounts of work and development work. World Vision is uh, more evangelical. World Vision is a development organization that has over one billion dollars in development uh, organization stuff and they do all kinds of things on climate change. They're one of the first organizations to be accredited for the Green Climate Fund. True or false? Now let's go to the Catholics. Pope Francis said, the earth, our home, is beginning to look more and more like an immense pile of filth. How many people say true? How many people say false? Okay, people have heard about this. <laughs> Pope Francis came uh, and announced June 18th, 2015, uh, from the encyclical Praise Be on the care of our common home. So um, there are 1.2 billion Catholics in the world. So um, they are a very patriarchal uh, religion. So you can actually have a pope and, and then that can affect 1.2 billion Catholics. Uh, or not. Um, the previous pope actually is the one that put solar panels on, on the Vatican, okay? So people just didn't hear about the previous pope doing a whole bunch of environmental stuff, Pope Benedict. This pope is very, uh, er he has uh, over uh, six million Twitter followers, okay? He is a very influential person, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I got, a, a Buddhist was asking me, well, look, why are you asking us about the environment? stuff. You need to get the Catholics in on this. You need to get the Pope to do something. This was back last September. And I looked and there's a Pontifical Academy of Sciences and the Pope has actually been speaking with scientists for years and years and years, Nobel laureates and all this sort of stuff. And they actually met the scientists and the whole scientific basis on this. They met in 2014 in May and actually did a whole bunch of the basis for what became uh, the encyclical. So this is a huge uh, uh, game changer. Then there are other religions such as the uh, uh, Islam and the Muslims. True or false, all 6,000 mosques in Jordan are installing rooftop solar panels. How many say true? How many say false? Okay, uh, the answer is it's true. All of these are true. There's huge amount of environmental uh, initiatives in the Muslim world. And this is the largest group of people in the world, 1.6 billion people. It is not a patriarchal religion, and it is very dispersed, and you cannot say a one-size-fits-all for any Muslims. I was very uh, happy to take actually a class, uh, a, a week-long class on Islam, and I really didn't know nothing about it, and uh, now I know something, and it's really amazing. And uh, so that was actually one of the incredible things. So um, the first time I got to see the secretary in person was actually last September at the Eid al Hadha celebration at our office, and this guy is another Jefferson Science Fellow in the Global Food Security. He actually wrote talking points for the secretary speech, which was on uh, the Eid celebration has to do with food after, after the um, Ramadan. So um, one of the things I did was also write a, an engagement strategy for Muslims on the environment at the State Department. So, but one of the main things that I did was, okay, 
I, I didn't quite understand that scientists aren't the best communicators at this point. So I thought, how can scientists actually start talking about what's happening abroad? So the Fulbrights, which actually go through the State Department, I, I asked for volunteers, and there's uh, thousands of grad students and others in the U.S. studying from abroad, and, there, uh, and there's bunches of climate scientists and other kind of scientists, and they all volunteered, or a bunch of them volunteered, to go and speak in churches and be a witness of climate change in their own country. Uh, then, so I got that group together, but one of the cool things about working in the State Department is if I email something or I call, uh, call somebody, they answer your emails. They, I, you call from the State Department, people answer your call. And one of the best things was that Green Faith, which is a major, major interfaith organization that actually mobilizes people around climate change, and then there's Climate Voices, which is a science speakers network. And um, the science speaker network wanted to speak in churches, and the Green Faith people wanted to have scientists speak uh, in in their uh, places all over. So I just got them together, and then they do all the work. It's amazing. So we don't give them any money, but we actually activate people who are already interested in doing this. So on Green Faith Days, more than 70 scientists spoke with faith groups all around the US. This is one of them. He's a Fulbright scholar, Percy Jinga, a PhD student from Zimbabwe. And one of the other things I got to do was figure out where all these countries are. Zimbabwe is in Africa, for those of you who care. I always would Google map and try and figure out where these countries were. So just so you know, that's where Zimbabwe is. So another thing is there's a whole thing called morethanscientist.org where you're trying to get personal experiences of scientists. These are supposed to be not heavily produced videos because if you heavily produce a video people say oh yeah you have a script and you're told to say that. So um, we got a couple of these Fulbrighters, Mamadou from Burkina Faso, okay that's there, and Daniel from Honduras and they have these videos that you can go watch. And so um, there's more videos up there, like Catherine Hayhoe has some. But one of the things that I just started at the end, um, so we got these wonderful interns, and Karlski is sitting in my office two weeks before he's leaving and I'm leaving, and I, I was telling him all about this, and he said, man, you scientists are really boring, <laughs> and these videos are boring, okay? And he basically, uh, in two weeks, uh, we, he decided it's better to have the faith groups actually talk about what they're doing themselves. And so once again, I, I've gone to Green Faith and Interfaith Power and Light, which is another big group, and um, they are going to start hosting a program. It's going to be similar to the Ice Bucket Challenge where they're saying, this is what we're doing, what are you doing uh, in our faith thing, and it's going to actually be an international thing. So Karlski, with his iPhone, <laughs> went and, 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 and taped and did all this stuff for this video, and it's right now, um, this is another thing, the State Department, you can't host things without a huge amount of hassle, so we're waiting for Green Faith to start hosting this video. <laughs> Um, that's the U.S. Health, that we work with banks, energy institutes, to interact climate change, uh, and then we get the involved in energy efficiency, and putting our solar panels into public policy advocacy. What you see behind me is our 10 kilowatt solar panel energy system. In 2011, we instituted this system, and frankly, it, it was about money. We were saving 20% on our electric bill. Uh, rebates allowed us, and the stimulus package allowed us to put this on, and uh, will raise money and it has changed, changed our lives, it's changed our consciousness about climate and uh, being good stewards of the earth. We were looking for an opportunity to catch some of the water here and let it absorb into the ground so it doesn't overflow and bring pollution to the Chesapeake Bay and cause a lot of damage and kill, kill fish. That's
that's Carl's kid, by the way. Mentors Friends is a national training cooperative, and we have three programs that we offer to congregations across the country. One is a field school that teaches teenagers in cohorts of 50 students at a time how to take a crop from field to market using a cooperative business model. The other is our Soil and Soul Tech Sanctuary, where we share the biblical principles behind our conservation work. The other program that will go into operation uh, next year is our apprenticeships with young adults, where they learn to remediate soil from toxic substances to manage watersheds and stormwater as well. There's a direct connection between the environment and uh, uh, I'll say as, as religious leaders, uh, we take it from Genesis. Go and, and, and be caretakers of the earth. That's the mandate that was given in Genesis, the second chapter. Uh, so we, we look at that and we take that we take that in a very uh, personal sense. How can we take care of God's earth? God gave us one earth, we got to pass it on. Uh, we've got to take good care of it. So that's the video that Carl Ski did that we hope will help jumpstart this other program that they're going to be doing with the other folks. So then if you look, I'm finishing up now. So I um, did do some more development work some with varying degrees of success. Uh, some of the things I worked on are solar lanterns and entrepreneurship in Pakistan, uh, Sri Lanka environmental issues with Buddhist monks, shared water and religion in the Balkans where there's uh, Muslims uh, and Orthodox Christians and Catholics all sharing some uh, water sites. Uh, then, so those are just some of the development projects. So now you can ask, okay, what was the benefit to the State Department? So what did they get out of me? Um, physicists and other scientists, we think differently than, and we're trained differently than most Foreign Service officers. Um, these people are really bright. So one of the things that I took out of this whole thing is that, um, you know, when I first came to the Office of Religion and Global Affairs, there was this lady from Mississippi, and she was talking to me and chatting me up, and I thought, oh boy, this is going to be interesting. And I later find out that she's now retiring from the Foreign Service after her 25 years. She speaks five languages. She's been in intelligence. She's done all of this stuff. She can write. She's one of the smarter people that I've ever met, okay? She can write, she can take something that I say in a paragraph and make it all come out in like, who knows, like 16 words or something. These people are really gifted. They pass the Foreign Service exam and that Foreign Service exam is hard, okay? I could not pass it. They can communicate and they have all these incredible skills. So a physicist, J JSF and I were uh, talking with one of the guys in my office and um, he actually had taken chemistry, but there's actually some um, people who have undergrad, uh, a lot of undergrad science from my office. And we were asking him, and, uh, so why did you study? And he was like, oh, well, I was at Stanford and I studied IR. And, and, we're, and Steve, the physicist, and I think, oh, infrared, what is he talking about? <laughs> no, it's international relations, okay? And it's just a different way of learning. And so part of what we got to do was help them solve problems. Just the way we think is differently than the way those guys are trained. So um, I know they were happy with what I did. At KU, what are we getting out of it? Well, next semester, I hope that those of you who want to will sign up for a Physics 400 that I'm going to be t um, teaching on science and policy. 
And uh, I haven't talked much about how science and policy work, but hopefully by the time I teach this class, I'll have more information, and, uh, but also uh, maybe uh, come back and talk to you about that. Um, there's a whole bunch of uh, interns in Washington, D.C. from Kansas, and I want to see if we can start promoting science interns as opposed to just the IR and the political science and other things. Uh, there's about, this has been a program now for 30 years on the KU campus. I learned more in Washington, D.C. about what's happening on the rest of the KU campus than I learned here. And then I'm also exploring some work on Power Africa and microgrids. So all of this said, I am really impressed. I, I thought, wow, I'm going to tell them about climate change. No, they knew. We didn't have to talk about the science. People knew. Uh, people also knew all these incredible things. There were all these really bright people. I'm really impressed with the talent there. This part of our government is really functioning, okay? I, we tend to think our government is not functioning. These people, it is working. <laughs> these people are, are, are really going at it. Civil service, everything. It is really impressive. The other thing is that you are the government. I have hope. You guys can do stuff. You can go out there and, 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 and change the world because if you want to, you can do it. And what you have to do is start communicating with people who you might not necessarily communicate with all the time. So this cultural experience was different. And <laughs> evidently, I didn't quite get the full cultural experience because I'll leave you with our picture that we took. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Alice. Uh, now we have some time for um, questions. Uh, uh, if anybody has any questions or comments? Uh, did you get to travel overseas? So Jill is asking, did I get to travel overseas? So um, I uh, chose not to travel. I could have traveled. Part of the Jefferson Science Fellowship comes with a travel stipend. I, I did travel to, in the US a few times. Yeah. Uh, what are the penalties for like these international agreements? Like, what's the binding nature of the agreements? <laughs> wow. So he's asking, what are the penalties, or what are the binding nature of the agreements? Boy, that's a good question. <laughs> Uh, w the way that these agreements are set up, they're actually, tr they're like legal agreements, right? But what is going to happen if you don't satisfy it? That, I don't know, I, I'm not sure I could give you a, a well thought out answer at this point. Uh, it doesn't sound like you did any interagency uh, collaboration at all. Do we, uh, Science advisor for, for the White House, etc. So he's asking, it sounds like you didn't do any interagency collaboration. Actually, part of my job was to understand what, how, uh, how other agencies are interacting with uh, faith groups. Uh, so uh, actually, Obama set up a whole framework for uh, interacting with religious groups. So there's a White House uh, faith office. There's actually a person at the Department of Energy who is also supposed to um, work with faith groups. So for instance, if you put solar panels up on your house, uh, I can get a tax credit. But since uh, faith groups are actually um, uh, aren't taxable, or uh, they actually can't get back that tax credit. So what are the incentives for your church to put up this stuff? And so the, um, faith groups actually met with the Secretary of Energy to try and understand. Uh, uh, Energy actually has better buildings and all sorts of other things. I also met with people from the EPA, Okay, they have a smart uh, energy, um, they have a whole program that actually reaches out to, um, you You can go on the web and get a toolkit that helps your congregation uh, do energy conservation and stuff like that. I was at the White House several times. Um, I, I got to <laughs> see the Oval Office, not with the president there, but um, I, I got to go in the working White House several times. We met with several groups, and so I worked with them. Now, the intelligence, I uh, had some meetings with them, and I also um, 
went to talks, but I would say that that part uh, wasn't huge. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Or? Yeah, Hugh. Since you need 67 senators to, <laughs> to uh, approve a treaty, uh, what do you do with treaties that you don't, that they're not ratified? So he says, since you need 67 senators to approve a treaty, what do you do with treaties that aren't ratified? Well, you have an example of that of the Kyoto Protocol. So what happened uh, was the U.S. continued doing what we were proposing to do anyway. We just didn't get credit with any of our international partners for doing it. So what has been proposed by the president, as I was mentioning, are mostly things that can be done with administrative action and don't require a congress. Okay, so, um, so does that mean that if there's a treaty, it won't be ratified? I can't tell, okay? But it doesn't have to be a treaty to still have the agreement and still have the U.S. working on it. 